form of media um, and I think news stories can be condensed into smaller pocketed information. It comes from a wide range of places and there are so many places you can get your news from. Although it's not always the most reliable, I do read news through that as well. You should never go to TikTok to find out something. You find out stuff while you're scrolling on TikTok. TikTok's core users are the young. A study found that some 16 to 24 year olds spend an hour a day on the app. And of that age group, many are heading to the polls for the first time, with 83% saying they get their news online. Cue the spin doctors of a digital age conjuring up content to draw youngsters to the ballot box. And here's what it looks like. typical party political broadcast. If politicians think that this will keep youngsters on side, our panel say they couldn't be more wrong. It's just so superficial. Ultimately, all that shows is that they perceive us as people who will be swayed politically and influenced by a silly joke. Ouch, a bit of an own goal then. And that's coming from the target audience. All first-time voters, all unimpressed by the political content geared towards them. You know, it seems quite shallow that uh, a lot of parties are using memes and jokes on TikTok attacking each other. It almost makes politics seem like a big joke. I find it deeply infuriating. I think it's sort of like cheap point scoring, it's a way to get a laugh. We love memes, yes we do, but when it comes to politics, um, especially in such uncertain times, we're not looking for memes. We're looking for actual like policies, we're looking for actual things that you're gonna do. It's a bit like a little bit like the front page of a newspaper, TikTok sort of does that, it gives you the big headline or the big tagline or something a little bit controversial and you just take it as that's what has happened. I find myself sort of reminding myself that it's, t it's showing me things I want to see rather than the, the fuller picture. We realise that people, for whatever reason now, don't seem to have the attention span to read an article in length or really delve into something deep. So what they try and do is appeal you in five and ten seconds. I think that's going to be an incredible danger as we move forward into the future because that's how people will start taking information in little snippets and little sound bites and it would be a shame if parties begin to play on that. So if that's the reaction, what's gone wrong? Or is TikTok really the place for politics? It was very much a platform associated with lip syncing and dancing, that's what people always used to say about it. That's Sophia smith Gala an award-winning journalist and one of the first national broadcasters to find success on the app. One of the most fascinating things about social media and politics and where, where TikTok sits in it is that they took a decision as a platform very early on to not allow political advertising. I say this is unique. Instagram allow it, YouTube allow it, Facebook, Meta, all allow it. So for TikTok not to allow it, and instead they're demanding politicians make very good organic content, which is, does not come easily to everyone, they're expecting them to do that. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, well, why don't they want political advertising on the platform? Surely they have made loads of money, but also that there's no one trying to use them to influence, you know, malevolently influence an election, which is what platforms almost always get accused of doing. One party, though, does seem to be winning in the amount of canvassing done in cyberspace. If we take the Conservatives and Labour, for example, you will see that the output, you know, the sheer number of TikToks that have been uploaded per day has been a lot higher than the Conservatives. That has come with a higher follower account and higher engagement rate. The Conservative TikTok strategy does not seem to be as intense. Uh, there, frankly, do not seem to be as many resources devoted to it. All of the parties are spending money to try and get young followers to follow them. In the fortnight since Rishi Sunak called the general election, major parties put their hands in their pockets to kickstart their online campaigns. Labour topping that list with £1.4 million, spending almost double the Conservatives' its £750,000. The 
the Liberal Democrats spent £45,000 and Reform UK spending £8,000. Money may be well spent if the parties are trying to play a longer game than just this election. We know that political parties spend millions upon millions having to do an awful lot of research on their behaviour, on their demographics, having to do their homework on how to cut through uh, because they're actually competing against influencers who, let's face it, um, are used to doing this to create content which is funny, witty and, and relevant. How do you think political parties can be sure that their messaging is reaching the right people at the right time? If you think about TikTok being the ongoing party um, that you're attending, um, you've got the people which are the content that are attending the party as well, and the host is the algorithm. So basically the host observes you, he might give you content that's generally a bit of sport, a bit of cooking content, for example, and then quickly he, he observes you and what your likes are, who you interact with, and then he'll make personal introductions and give you content which is tailored to keeping you on the platform and keeping you engaged. Certainly for now, though, where these young voters are concerned, the politicians aren't about to be a massive viral hit. I think it's totally missed the mark. I don't really think it's been successful at all. Generally, young people turn them into more of a mockery, <laughs> the politicians, um, and I think it's ineffective what they're trying to do. It's not the fact that they're not capable of using social media. It's the fact that they're incapable of understanding what really motivates young people. The parties can only hope that the swipes, likes and shares actually translate to join an X on the ballot paper on July 4th. Amy Sutton, ITV News. And Amy joins us in the studio now with more on this. So Amy, online campaigning, it's not a new concept, but political parties, they have really focused this time on this new wave of, of TikTok this time around. Well, last election, TikTok was in its infancy and records and data of previous online campaigns didn't even register its relevance. But now, as a social media app and as a news source, it's completely changing the game. And as we saw in my report, it's also pulling on the purse strings of all major parties to spend a lot of money on a very different type of campaigning. Now, it is surprising, though, that party leaders are eager to boost their profile on the app. After all, it was only a few months ago that the House of Commons actually banned the use of the Chinese-owned TikTok app from its parliamentary network over security concerns. Previously, many British MPs actually used the app quite frequently, but then it was blocked from devices that were issued to them. There's a weird irony about that conflict, isn't it, about how important the platform is now to their campaigning. And we saw it in your report there, which was fascinating, some of the contributions um, without belittling those youngsters at all, um, were tremendous Absolutely. and they vocalise very well the way that they understand the media and the, the political parties don't. Um, the different amounts of money that the different parties are spending on this also came through as some very different sums. Absolutely. I mean, the figures we had shown Labour are completely the outlier on this. And perhaps that's part of a push to bring in a younger generation of voters. We did ask the Conservatives why they're not matching that spending, but they haven't got back to us as of yet. We've talked about spending aid, we've talked about the prevalence of this app, particularly amongst young people, but how likely is it that this kind of content is then going to turn into votes? Well, not if the first time voters we spoke to uh, any indication. Now look, the videos, they're funny, they're engaging, but what we're hearing is there is a desire there for information and for fact and for policy, and that's what it's lacking, but that's what they want. Remember, the target demographic here is 18 to 25 year old, and it is shown that they aren't always showing up to vote. So we'll find out in just over two weeks' time whether or not all that money spent will actually equate to seats in Parliament. Absolutely well. Amy, thank you very much indeed for that insight. Really interesting. The ITV Evening News uh, on the television continues at 6.30 with Luke Cressy. Coming up, the Conservative Party's campaign director is investigated over alleged bets on the timing of the election. Four of the Prime Minister's close connections are now under investigation with two weeks until polling day. Interest rates remain the same despite inflation falling, but there could be hope on the horizon. And England fans assemble in Frankfurt as Southgate squad take on Denmark. Join me for those stories and more at 6 30. Well, we will have an update on that England game very shortly. We're going to stay with sport here though now because the men who led Gateshead Football Club to victory at Wembley last month have been rewarded today. 
The management team of Rob Elliott and Louis Story also helped steer the club through troubled times at the end of the season as they were thrown out of the National League promotion playoffs in that row over their stadium. Simon O'Rourke reports. This is a big deal, but at the same time, not a big deal. Basically, last season's interim management team aren't interim anymore. Rob Elliott's now the permanent manager. Louis Story's the permanent assistant player manager. Not much changes, but not much needed to change on the football side. We've gone through what everyone's aware of in terms of the playoffs, etc. But I think we're coming out the other side. And the, the big thing for me, which is one of the most pleasing reasons to sign, is that there's a real hunger from everyone at the club to go and put that right next year. We'd like to think that we've made some real good plans to improve the football side. But also we've had some real positive conversations with the board that can get the whole football club looking to move forward. Things do need to change off the pitch, and the club knows it. After Gateshead were kicked out of the National League playoffs because of problems with their tenancy at Gateshead Stadium, lots of work has gone on behind the scenes to make sure that situation doesn't arise again. We are working with um, the council and the, uh, the governing bodies that we, that we operate on that to ensure that uh, we're in a better place and we're making progress and we're really happy with it. You did mention that you're at least exploring the possibility of a new stadium. Is that just the reality of where the club finds itself? It is. We want to evolve and want to develop the club to make it more sustainable in the future and have something that, that is ours in the, in the long term. Today's management confirmation and the tease of good news on the way about the playing squad means Heed fans can look forward with confidence. Whatever went wrong last season, it didn't go wrong on the pitch and it ended with a Wembley win, a trophy and perhaps the greatest day in Gateshead's history. Well, sticking with sports, there are some concerns that uh, some grassroots sports clubs may be under threat uh, and is linked to climate change. And that's according to the British Association for Sustainable Sport. Yeah, the wet weather that we had this winter and into the spring has led to water off pitches and lots of cancelled matches across our region. And now clubs are worried that it could become a more regular occurrence, as Catherine Walker reports. This winter has been one of the wettest on records and it's caused significant disruption here at Tynemouth Cricket Club. Flooded pitches have limited game time, leaving staff worried about the future. So normally the pre-season starts in January, we come outside around early April, we miss our pre-season games, then the first team had the first two games rained off, so of the first six weeks we've only played three. So the first team have missed a few games, the second have had a couple rained off, and our field was down, down through the third team and through to the juniors. Scientists predict the UK will start to see wetter winters more often due to climate change. And now new research shows this extreme weather is having a direct impact on people's activity levels in our region. Figures from Sport England show that nearly two thirds of adults in the North East have done less sport due to extreme weather, with over half saying they felt less motivated. Nearly a third think it could have a negative impact on their activity levels over the next five years. It's undeniable that the impacts of climate change and the storms, floods, droughts and heat are disrupting grassroots sport now and pose a significant threat for, for the long term. You know, there's statistics um, there that 62,500 grassroots football matches were cancelled or postponed last year because of climate change. Access to sport is important for our physical and mental well-being. And without investment in infrastructure, climate expert Anika says it's those who need their local clubs the most who will be hit the hardest. Drainage infrastructure needs to be there to drain rainwater as fast as possible after a prolonged rainfall. And also more options for indoor activities when outdoor activities are impossible. Whether it's flooded pitches or extreme heat, climate change and sport are intrinsically linked. And grassroots clubs are worried that postponements and cancellations will become a regular part of their fixtures. Catherine Walker, ITV News. Yeah, the weather really does affect everything, doesn't it? We have had wetter than average months in the lead up to now, yeah. but now, <laughs> I haven't seen now, it's been all right today, actually. Yeah, a, a dry day stands out now, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, parts of the region having a year's worth of months that have been wetter than average. Today, just in time, it's brightened up, it's dried up, and it is, of course, the summer solstice. The longest day, start of astronomical summer. 
the sun shining over Durham here. Uh, got up to 22.4 degrees in Durham today, so above the average, and also over 17 hours of daylight for all of us today. Sunrise was at around 4.30. You had to be up early to get it, as these people were in Sela this morning. So, yeah, looking absolutely stunning. What a nice photograph. Now, to go there, you had to be up at around 4.20 in the morning. So, <laughs> yeah. it They're looks having a long stunning. day for that yeah. well, Thank you to whoever took the photograph. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to go to see it myself. <laughs> no, exactly that. Yeah, yeah we, we knew it was rising early. We've got evidence it happened, and it's going to happen again tomorrow. Here's your forecast. Now, with our temperatures reaching back up into the low 20s at times, that feel of summer is in the air. And although low pressure is nearby through the next few days, so we could see the cloud thickening at times, a few showers around. It is going to stay mostly dry, mostly settled, lots of sunshine in the mix, and still warm where the sunshine breaks through. We've got that flow coming up from the southwest. It's lifted the temperatures. From the west, though, as we head through the next couple of days, there are some fronts trying to move their way from west to east. As they approach us, they're mostly petering out. Actually, through the weekend, there is plenty of fine weather to be had. In fact, we're seeing that as we make our way through this evening and overnight. Really lovely end to the day. Lots of sunshine holding on to those milder temperatures as we head into the early hours. Some lighter breezes, too. We could see some patches of mist forming into the early hours. As temperatures for some hold up at around 13 or 14 degrees. So definitely on the milder start as we head into Friday morning. Friday itself. Good start today. Lots of sunshine, some unbroken blue skies. Now, from the west, we're beginning to see the impact of the low pressure. The cloud will thicken later on. Little bits of patchy rain spreading through. But that's for later, actually, for much of the day. Lots of sunshine. The wind's coming up from that warm direction. And that combination is lifting temperatures up to a warm 23 degrees. Now, as we make our way through Friday and into Saturday, Overnight, things go downhill a little bit. We've got the cloud thickening. We've got this front here, so bits of patchy rain. That's clearing its way out towards the North Sea. And the good news is, by the time most of us wake up on Saturday morning, it has taken a lot of the cloud, the patchy rain with it. Things are starting to clear up, so plenty of sunshine around. Similar story through Sunday into Monday. Temperatures holding up. We're talking high teens, potentially the low 20s, and staying mild overnight as well. Two weeks sponsored, ITV, Tankies Weather. And there is a slight price to pay for the fine weather as the weather picks up, so do those pollen levels. The grass pollen season is peaking at the moment. Dry, fine conditions will leave levels very high as we head through the next few days. Thank you, Ross. Now, we said we'd have a little update on the football for you. And luckily, for these football fans in the fans zone in Newcastle, it's a dry day. Um, England are currently playing Denmark uh, in the Euros. So some concerned faces there. It's one all. There's roughly half an hour to go. Half an hour left. Do not switch over because here, the national and international news is coming up next. Bye-bye.